Good evening. A very, very warm welcome. I know the weather could have been cooler, but the welcome is warm, whatever the weather. Thank you all for coming. We are delighted, privileged and honored that Dr. Raghuram Rajan has agreed to step into our portal and address us today. The occasion is auspicious. We are here to pay tribute to one of our legendary teachers. And we are here to pay tribute to one of our legendary departments. I'm really, really so proud of being a presidential, as at least more than half the hall is today. We are all presidentials, and we are proud of each other. We are proud of our Department of Economics, which has, in Presidency University, had a rich heritage. In its golden era, this department ran, arguably, one of the finest undergraduate programs in the world. Many of its alumni had achieved international renown in academics. Although Amartya Kumar Sen, recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1998, is possibly the most well-known alumni, there were others like Bhavatosh Dotto, Nihil Rokhe, Omiyo Bakshi, Abhijit Vinayak Banerjee, Devraj Rai, Pranab Bardhan, Maitrish Khattak, to name a few. These have all become stalwarts in their own fields. Simultaneously, the department has been a source of robust talent to the private and government sectors where a lot of ex-students of the department have risen to prominence and they hold leadership positions. Notable among these are the late Shukumar Chakravarti, Dr. Bimal Jalan, and Dr. Amit Mitra, who is currently the Honorable Finance Minister of the Government of West Bengal. Professor Deepak Banerjee was one of the legendary teachers of economics at Presidency College. He graduated from the London School of Economics with, as Lord Lionel Robbins wrote, an unbroken string of A's. Although he was offered a graduate fellowship to do his PhD and an assistant lecturership later at the London School of Economics, Deepak Banerjee chose to come to Presidency College as assistant professor. He subsequently returned to London School of Economics for a brief period and also spent a year at Berkeley. Apart from these two stints, he remained faithfully in the Department of Economics, Presidency College, for over four decades, starting from the late 1950s, where he inspired one brilliant economist after another. It was then that legends started accumulating, and this charismatic teacher was, had this legend of the myth of DB, as he was known to his students. After he passed away in 2007, the Deepak Banerjee Memorial Lecture was instituted, and we thank Abhijit Vinayak Banerjee and Mrs. Nirmala Banerjee for their grace. Earlier speakers for the Deepak Banerjee Memorial Lecture were eminent economists like Devraj Rai, Maitrish Khattak, Amit Bhaduri, Joseph Stiklitz, Amartya Sen, and Dilip Mukherjee. Our eighth Deepak Banerjee Memorial Lecture is going to be delivered by Dr. Raghuram Govind Rajan. Dr. Raghuram Govind Rajan is the current governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Dr. Rajan has had a distinguished academic career. After graduating from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, as an electrical engineer, he completed his postgrad in business administration from Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. Dr. Rajan received a PhD from MIT Sloan School of Management for his dissertation on banking. Subsequently, he joined the University of Chicago's Graduate School of Business as a faculty in the Department of Finance in 1991. Since then, he has held distinguished positions at various international organizations and served the Indian government in multiple capacities. Most notably, he was the chief economist at the International Monetary Fund from 2003 to 2006 and chief economic advisor to the government of India from 2012 to 2013, after which he was appointed the 23rd governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Dr. Rajan has received many professional awards and distinctions throughout his distinguished career. In 2003, he won the Fisher Black Prize awarded by the American Finance Association for contributions to theory and practice of finance by an economist under the age of 40. He was elected president of the American Finance Association in 2011. In 2013, he was the recipient of the Deutsche Bank Prize for Financial Economics 
for groundbreaking research in finance and macro policy. In 2014, he was conferred the Best Central Bank Governor Award by the Euro Money Magazine and also the Governor of the Year Award by the London-based publication Central Banking. His 2010 book, False Flies, How Hidden Fractures Still Threaten the World Economy, won the Financial Times and Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year Award for 2010. His latest feats have earned him worldwide recognition as in his first two years in office, inflation has come down, <coughs> interest rate has eased to 7.25% from 8% in 2014, the forex kitty has swelled, and the rupee has become more resilient. Plus, there have been two rounds of new bank license awards, including the birth of an entirely new breed of banks in the country. It is a privilege for us, Dr. Rajan, that you agreed to deliver the 8th Deepak Banerjee Memorial Lecture at Presidency University. You've inspired all of us in so many ways, with your academic excellence, with your economic policy, with your confident approach to taking strong decisions, and of course, with your public statements in what you believe to be right. Welcome, Dr. Rajan. Good evening. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. Madam Vice Chancellor, uh, distinguished faculty members, my friend Abhijit Banerjee, uh, Mrs. Banerjee, and uh, your students. It is a privilege to be here uh, speaking in honor of uh, a very beloved uh, faculty member of this, this uh, university. Um, academics uh, typically have influence uh, much wider than their particular um, narrow areas, but also long after they have stopped teaching, and in this case, passed away through their students and their students' students and, and so on. So it, it really uh, is uh, uh, a great honor to be speaking um, uh, in this lecture. Now, um, I had to find something to talk about that was not controversial, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> Parliament is in session and is usually not useful to create additional controversy. Um, also, given that this is a lecture in honor of a, a great professor, it's important to have some content, something that hopefully reflects thought and perhaps make you think. Um, so what I want to speak about today is, uh, is really debt, the role of debt in a free enterprise economy, and talk a little bit about how it is both essential to free enterprise as well as the source of some of the biggest calamities that can happen in a free enterprise system. Uh, why, in a sense, taking on debt is a Faustian bargain, where societies sell their souls, but it's almost necessary to, to advance. There's a very interesting book uh, that came out uh, last year uh, by David Graeber, called Debt the First 5,000 Years. Uh, here's a sociologist slash anthropologist who's talking about the role of debt in society. And for many economists, I think it's, it's useful to look at how other people see debt. But he reminds us that a 1,000 years ago, uh, money lenders, uh, they were called usurers in the, in the West, uh, were people who were hated, um, and some would say they still hated around the world. Uh, today they call bankers, but uh, uh, this is a, uh, this is something that has uh, that has been there through much of history. Um, sermons of church uh, um, of priests, um, thousand years ago in in, uh, in in Europe, were full of horror stories about how God's judgment would fall 
on unrepentant lenders. Stories of these rich men being struck down by madness or terrible disease, haunted by nightmares of the snakes or demons who in hell would soon eat their flesh. So uh, the idea was lending for interest was a terrible thing. And those who committed this, uh, who indulged in this practice, uh, were really uh, uh, bad people, terrible people. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the Pope issued instructions to local parishes that all known usurers were to be excommunicated. They were not to be allowed to receive the sacrament. And under no grounds, uh, under no conditions, could their bodies be buried uh, in hallowed uh, ground. And there are stories of this kind which reflect the, the kind of contempt that the lender was held in. Um, one example, there's a French cardinal who told uh, a story about a particularly influential money lender who, whose friends, uh, after he died, tried to pressurize the parish priest to overlook the rules and have him buried in the local churchyard. And since these were very influential friends, the priest said, uh, okay, let's see, we'll put his body on a donkey and see God's will and what he'll do with the body. Wherever the donkey takes the body, be it a church, a cemetery, or elsewhere, there I will bury it. And the body was placed on the donkey, and the donkey, without deviating either to the left or the right, took it straight out of town to the place where thieves are hanged from the gibbet, and with a hearty buck sent the body flying into the dung below the gallows. So, so this is, uh, what was thought of the lender at that time. Of course, just before the financial crisis, we lionized the banker. I would presume that dowry rates in India, which are a very good example of the status of different professions, were very high for foreign bankers, people who had a good job in Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs. I would presume post-financial crisis, those rates have come down somewhat. Uh, <laughs> But certainly in the West, uh, if you look at business schools, the most sought after profession was that of, of a banker. Uh, many of our students at, at, at the Booth School uh, used to go there. Today, not so. Uh, today, probably the most sought after job is that in some of these startups, and a close second is consulting. Why the change? And the change is not just now. You see the change in societies over time. Uh, usury was condemned by the church in the 12th and 13th century, but not in the 14th and 15th century. And it was condemned again in the 16th and 17th century, but not afterwards. So why is it that we have this ambivalent attitude towards debt? Why do we favor it at some times? Why do we hate it at other times? And the reason, to some extent, is debt is very much like dynamite. It's an instrument which is very useful in the right places, explosive in others. There is always a temptation to overuse it because it's so easy to use, and sometimes very warped incentives to use it. However, despite these difficulties associated with debt, banning debt is typically not an option. The right answer typically is, can we get moderation? And for a regulator like me, can I regulate moderation even in the face of very strong political economy reasons to throw caution to the wind? Uh, massive clamor to reduce interest rates, to ease capital requirements, to uh, facilitate lending in a very big way uh, in good times only for society to pay the price in bad times. And the real question is, can we moderate uh, the, the pressure in the good times, do only so much of it as is necessary so that we don't face terrible times? So let's, let's ask, what are the characteristics of debt that cause this, this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, both benefit and, uh, and problem? Now, think of what debt replaces. Typically, in more primitive societies without an enforcement structure, 
what you really have is favors. I do a favor for you, and following a broad norm of reciprocity, you keep that in mind as a debt you owe me, and you repay the favor sometime down the line by doing a favor for me. Right? So somebody in, in a village who has a, a harvest of, uh, of say, uh, ladies' fingers will take some of the excess and spread it around, give other people. And those people, when they have their harvest of apples or have, they have their harvest of pumpkins, will give back some of those. But this kind of favor, mutual favor, uh, is a way of building social bonds. And over time is a source of social insurance also. When you run short and you have nothing to give, still the village may look after you and, uh, and repay some of these favors. What this debt does is make all this very explicit. It says, I will repay you thus and such amount at thus and such day. And if I don't repay you, you have some power over me. You can seize some assets. You can put me in jail. In the days there were debtors' prisons. Uh, basically, you can find forcible ways of getting it back. And these things are typically enforced by an external party. So one of the... Uh, uh, benefits of debt is it's a clear obligation, it's not fuzzy. And it is enforceable, so I don't have to rely on your continued good, goodwill. I can be as nasty as I want towards you, you still have to repay the debt. Unlike with a favor, where if I do a favor and we fall out, you don't have to repay the favor down the line. So this means that there's very limited mutual dependence. I don't have to depend on you for uh, I don't have to depend on you or much, uh, depend much on your performance because typically debt is secured, debt, debt uh, uh, can be forcibly repaid. Now one of the advantages of debt that has been extolled in recent uh, literature is because it's such a hard security, because often it is short term, sometimes it's runnable. It means I don't need to know very much about you. I don't need to trust you very much. I don't need to know very much about you because no matter how well your, or badly your business does, because I'm secured by, for example, the land that your business stands on, I can get repayment. I don't have to know what your business is. I don't even have to have any faith in you as an entrepreneur. Right? So the value of debt is that we can be really distant from each other, both in information as well as in social terms. And debt still flows between, I give it you up front, you have the resources to conduct your business, you repay me at the, uh, at the end. I mean, think about one of the most famous creditors in history, uh, Shylock from the Merchant of Venice. I mean, what was his method of enforcement? It was a pound of flesh. And therefore, he could lend to somebody he hated. In fact, of course, in the, in the play, it's about him actually wanting to get that pound of flesh rather than getting repaid. But it was an enforceable contract between two parties who had absolutely no empathy for each other. right? And typically, you find that in many communities, the lender, the creditor, the Shylock comes from outside the community because that's the only way they can have the dispassionate ability to recover regardless of the situation of the borrower. And it is that ability to recover under any circumstance that in fact allows them to lend up front. And this is something that people sometimes don't understand fully in India, right? Uh, that by making it hard for somebody to recover, we make it harder for somebody to lend in the first place. That enforcement of debt is necessary to get the lending in the first place. If you think that lending is good, we should be willing to enforce that contract. We have it in our regulations, for example. Sometimes we say you cannot take collateral against this loan. If we say you cannot take collateral, the incentive for the bank to lend is so much lower because it's not sure it will get repaid. It has no ability to enforce the repayment. 
So by saying you can't take collateral, we feel we're doing the borrower a favor. Yes, we're doing a favor to those who can get loans. But those who can get loans are far fewer than those who could get loans if we allowed collateral. Okay? So this is an example of where this kind of thought comes in, that it is the ability to enforce the debt contract that allows you to borrow, allows the other side to borrow up front. And, and typically, the shorter term the, the, the loan, the more collateralized it is, the more my ability to take the money and run, rather than wait in a bankruptcy court uh, for, to get the money back, the more willing I am to lend. Now you see already the contours of the problem with debt. That the easiest contract to borrow against is usually the hardest contract. Which means that the advantage on the one side is I can get resources when in need. Okay? Many of our poor people find it very easy to borrow from the money lender. Because the money lender has so many sources of recovery some legitimate, some illegitimate. But they have so many more sources of recovering than perhaps the formal banker. So with debt, you can raise money easily. You can raise money without contacts. That's a good thing. I don't need to be embedded in a rich society to be able to borrow in that society. I don't need to have rich friends. I just need to know who's a rich money lender and go to them. They will be willing to lend to me because they, can, they know they can break my leg, so I don't repay. That's their source of enforcement, right? So the good thing about the debt contract is it works in transferring resources to those in need. And it can transfer, the more anonymous uh, the, the money lender is from me, the more liquid the contract is in, is in his hand. Because his ability to exercise power over me can be transferred to some other person. He's not recovering because I know him and I'm friendly with him and I'm going to repay him. In that case, it's a very illiquid contract. The only reason I'm repaying is him is because he's my friend, not because the contract is enforceable. But once the contract is enforceable, it assumes a liquidity of its own. He can sell it to somebody else when in need, which again gives them greater incentive to lend to me in the first place. So the liquidity of the debt contract is another feature that is very beneficial. And, and the most important thing is outsiders can lend. So it expands the market for loans tremendously. Okay? So the, these are a bunch of reasons why the loan contract is, is, is very good. If you look at history, there's another reason why loan contracts are very effective. Because they're a formal commitment to repay over time. Basically, I can promise a whole stream of rents to the lender who's giving me money. I mean, this is how initially the Bank of England started. The Bank of England got a monopoly over the banking business in the United Kingdom. In return for that, it essentially paid a large sum of money to the UK government to the British government at that time, uh, the British king, it was essentially buying the monopoly by paying up front. But it knew that over time the lending business would generate rents over time, right? And those rents could be paid out, okay? So therefore, it could borrow money from the public against the future rents it would get. It could commit to repay the public that was the borrowing that it did up front. Take that money, pay the UK government for the privilege of being able to get that monopoly. So debt facilitated this transformation of a monopoly over banking into current revenue for the government. And that was because the public could trust they would get their money back from the Bank of England over time because they had a debt contract, long-term debt contract against it. So if you think about corporations, corporations can borrow over a long period, pledging a lot of value. They can borrow 30, year, 30 years against a power plant today, This is or 25 years in the 525 rule uh, that we have here today, because the power plant is going to generate revenues over 25 years. It has a debt contract. It has to repay the lender, and that allows it to borrow really long term, beyond the lives of anybody running the plant 
today. So debt allows um, uh, entities to pledge larger sums out of future value, especially long-lived institutions. Last point I want to make before I go to the disadvantages of debt is debt also, uh, to the extent that it, it is long-lived, uh, it also gives me an incentive uh, as uh, an entity issuing debt to commit myself to doing good things into the future because the more I commit myself to doing good things into the future, the more I can borrow today against my future value. So uh, think about countries. How can countries borrow today? They can borrow because they promise the, the, uh, the, the, the person lending to them that over the long run they will repay and, and in fact they commit to that repayment through the right kinds of governance structures, etc. Now, let me go to the disadvantages of debt uh, and, and then come to the trade-offs, right? Graeber's uh, uh, most important criticism of debt is it kills communities. And that's a fact. Uh, when we do favors for each other, these are implicit commitments to each other, we build communities. I know I can rely on you in times of trouble because I've done favors for you, you've done favors for me. It's so a kind of social, implicit social insurance. But once it's an explicit debt contract, you don't feel any sense of loyalty to me over and above the debt contract. There's an explicit claim. This, these bonds, which can be called upon in times of trouble, are not built. So instead of the favors which bind community, we get debt which is resented by the community, which makes the bonds between people much weaker. That's one of the concerns about debt. But of course, the flip side of this, the flip side of the anonymity introduced by debt is it expands the market. It allows people from outside the community to come and lend, which can allow the community to flourish uh, more effectively. See the trade-off? Um, it, it reduces community ties, but expands the resources the community can get. The big criticism against debt in the church canon, as well as in Islam today, is that because it's such a hard contract, the lender really doesn't take any risk. The lender is not participating in the enterprise, essentially extracts his pound of flesh without putting anything at stake except his money, and the borrower takes all the risk because the borrower, if the enterprise fails, essentially loses everything while the debtor goes away whole. This is the criticism against debt, which is why Islam often requires sharing. Uh, Interest-bearing uh, contracts are prohibited in Islam, while sharing contracts are much, much praised. But first, if you look at this carefully, uh, certainly Equity-like contracts may be uh, better from the sense of sharing the risk, but they may be harder to write because with, when you write a uh, sharing contract, you have to know what the other fellow is doing. You have to know his business. You have to trust him. You have to trust him to run his business. The anonymity which is embedded in debt is no longer there, which then brings in all the disadvantages. You have to have much more information. You have to have much more trust. And it is very hard for uh, really arm's length outsiders to come and lend. So, yes, equity would be a better contract to share the risk, but it would diminish the capacity of the person who wants to start an enterprise from getting resources. It would reduce his capacity simply because uh, the, the person who's sharing the risk will want to know much more, will want to have much more trust. Uh, the biggest criticism of debt that sometimes is levied is it makes promising very easy. And therefore, dictators can promise away the future of their country by borrowing enormous amounts and subjecting their countries to perpetual servitude uh, because of the debt they have built up. There's a whole literature now which has built up on what is called odious debt. That is, perhaps we shouldn't enforce contracts when a dictator borrowed to finance his arms build up 
or to finance uh, grand projects which, ne which, never, uh, which never played out. Similarly, in India, where we have a tradition of the son repaying the father's debt, uh, we've always had a lot of concern about debt bondage. Uh, maybe uh, the father hasn't thought enough about his children and, uh, and therefore borrows too much and sub subjects them perpetually to, to bondage. Of course, these kinds of concerns really mount to the fore when the current generation really does not care for the future generation, when a dictator doesn't care about the future of his country. But I think the, the real concern in these kinds of situations that, uh, that um, you know, public commentators really have is that debt in a situation of unequal bargaining allows excessive promises. This is always the Indian concern about the money lender. You go to the money lender when your children are starving, when your harvest has failed. At that point, you're willing to promise almost anything. And if you write a debt contract under those circumstances, that debt contract can be very, very onerous. So there are two things embedded in here. One is, of course, you're in great need. But the second thing is you're in a situation of monopoly that who you have to borrow from, there's no competition. There aren't others who come in. Because he's one of the few guys who knows about you who has the enforcement power in the community. That's why you don't find comparative money lenders in many communities. There are uh, a restricted group of money lenders who collude with each other because if they got into competition, uh, it would be much better for the borrower, but also the rents to the money lender would be uh, far smaller. This is why in community after community, when there's a high probability of distress, there is a great aversion to debt contracts. And these often are prohibited. In fact, there are studies talking about, I told you the church had different views about money lending over time. And if you track that, it has something to do with the riskiness of agriculture over those periods. In periods where agricultural holdings were small, and agricultural incomes were fluctuating a lot. At that point, the church got very nervous about money lending because the money lender would go in in times of drought, in times of stress, and essentially extract everything from the poor farmer at that point. That eventually caused social unrest, caused revolution. It was not something the church liked. But after the Black Death, for example, in the 14th century, um, because so many people died, land holdings were much bigger, especially in certain parts of Europe. And the peasant was much better diversified now, larger uh, plots of land, better ability to grow crops without adversity. And at that point, the church's attitude towards money lending changed. It became more favorable. Of course, um, there's a lot of controversy about this kind of debate and what the actual factors were, but certainly it seems reasonable to think that in situations where people at large are in situations of stress, society is much less favorable to lending and much more favorable to kind sharing contracts uh, than, than otherwise. So unequal bargaining, historically, unequal bargaining in situations of limited competition in lending has been one reason why we've been unfavorable towards debt. More recently, a big, a big factor against debt has been what we call moral hazard. And the reason here is that because debt is such a senior contract, because I don't have to think twice before lending, I'm willing to lend into situations where it doesn't make sense to lend. When the borrower is over borrowing, is borrowing too much from many borrowers. We all think we'll get our money back. Eventually, some of us won't. But we also hope that because we are all over lending, either the government or the IMF or somebody else will come in and bail us out. So we lend to excess. That is a more common uh, situation. So the first situation was situation of monopoly. Second is a situation of excess competition to lend, where multiple lenders come in uh, many of them assuming that they will be able to get their money back. And sometimes lending knowing 
that if they try and recover their money, somebody will come and bail them out because they won't, don't want to see a, a downturn. One, one example of this in the Indian context, I sometimes think, is external commercial borrowing. Indian banks make loans in a system where bankruptcy is relatively slow, relatively difficult. So Indian banks often are willing to negotiate when the borrower is in difficulty because they have to, uh, you know, uh, going through bankruptcy is, is very painful, not going to happen in finite time. But if there's a foreign lender who's lent to that same promoter in a situation where they can go approach the London courts or the New York courts, which are much faster, much more effective, they have a very strong threat in case they're not repaid, which is, you know, uh, you promoter, I'm going to seize your assets in London or I'm going to seize your assets in New York by filing for bankruptcy there. And then the promoter who has no money or, or claims to have no money then goes to his bank, uh, Indian bank, and says, look, they're threatening to take me into court, this will create disruption, uh, will ruin my business, but you care about my business, why don't you pony up some money so we can repay the foreign lender. So effectively, the ECB has a super senior claim, even though it may be unsecured, and it may not be uh, something that has high priority. There are, there are some stray instances of this happening, I don't want to say this is a general case, but this is an example of a situation where a lender comes in and makes further loans, knowing fully well they can get out, out ahead of the rest. And that creates a kind of moral hazard, which again promotes over lending. And finally, uh, one of the big concerns about debt has been post-financial crisis, when a number of countries have been growing very slowly. And the argument here is the very slow growth reflects what is called a debt overhang. That is, the creditor who has made the loan doesn't want to write down the value of the debt because they keep hoping that there'll be some way they will get repaid. And in the meantime, the borrower seeing this very high debt load basically says, what's the point of doing any improvements in my business or improvements in my house or maintaining my house when ultimately this is not going to belong to me, this is going to go to the lender. So essentially they stop activity or they slow down an activity which can then lead to much lower growth or much more distressed assets. Classic example in the US is borrowers who are deeply underwater basically trash their house. They take out every fitting, they stop maintaining it, they stop cleaning the lawn uh, or mowing the lawn, simply because it's not their house anymore. It belongs to the bank. And therefore, I have no incentive to maintain. That is what is called debt overhang. Ideally, the bank should recognize that the borrower has no equity and therefore is going to mistreat the property under the, under the borrower. They should either seize the property or write down the value of debt. Typically, they end up doing nothing. And as a result, the property festers and gets worse over time. So when you have little ability to forgive and the borrower has little ability to pay, essentially you have a situation where the borrower has little incentive to invest in the property or the firm and you have very, very slow growth. Some people argue the slow growth post-2007 is a reflection of this practice. So, what I've described are the advantages of debt, much more of it available, available from uh, third parties whom you don't know. So it facilitates free enterprise, it facilitates anonymity, which is good because if the only people who succeeded were those with connections to rich people, it would be problematic in society. So it allows a level playing field. Downside, you tend to use too much of it, it's a hard contract, you tend to get into trouble, uh, the lender typically doesn't do the efficient thing and you have a, a lot of distress. So what do we do? How do we break this? And, and I would argue that many of the ways we have of, of making debt friendlier basically hit at the very benefits of debt. Um, for example, um, you know, courts in the past have done selective debt waivers. E even in India, we have had debt waivers. Um, you know, farm debt has been waived on a number of occasions. 
But repeatedly when these things happen, you see that the consequence of this forced waiver is actually lending falls off considerably. Um, Andhra Pradesh, you had microfinance over lending uh, to uh, you know, borrowers. Uh, essentially, we had a massive waiver when the Andhra Pradesh government basically said don't prepay. Effectively, that was what happened. A lot of microfinance firms went, got into trouble. But the net effect is lending essentially dropped off to close to nothing in the years that followed in Andhra Pradesh. So you have to weigh these selective waivers, uh, these, these waivers against the longer term consequences, which is lending drops off. Now, in the United States, they've actually had some very interesting waivers in the past. In the 19th century, there used to be situations where there used to be massive droughts, uh, lots of, uh, of farm losses. Farmers could not repay. When this happened on a wide scale across the country, what they did was brought in a bankruptcy law for a few years so that the farmers could, under the bankruptcy law, get a debt waiver, get the debt written down or waived completely. But then after that emergency was over, they repealed the law. So there was no law to, to allow for bankruptcy. And lenders now confident there was no way that their debt would be waived again until there was a countrywide national calamity were willing to lend once again. So they tried to manage the trade-off between a hard contract and a soft contract, essentially saying, in times of global calamity, we'll make it soft, but in normal times, it will be hard. And, and therefore, they got the benefits of debt without too much of uh, the cost. Now, uh, there are other ways uh, one can uh, think about this. Uh, but in general, I would say, there is no simple answer that essential to what debt does is the hardness of the debt contract. And the harder the debt contract is, the more you can borrow. There's a lot of talk going on amongst academics that, you know, this whole uh, uh, leverage in the banks was not particularly useful. And I agree that 50 to 1 leverage in some of the banks was simply too much. But at the same time, they go to the opposite extreme and say there's no advantage to debt. We could have banks that are fully equity funded. And I would argue that it's complete nonsense. That you cannot get banks that are fully equity funded and have the kinds of costs of finance that you could have with banks that have substantial leverage. That's why we have banks with you know, uh, 10, 12 times the amount of debt uh, relative to equity. That's a reasonable leverage ratio. That's what we have in India. But I think that level of debt is necessary in order to give the borrower cheap finance. That if you had much less debt than that, finance to the borrower would become much costlier. So the argument that there's no cost to having more and more capital requirements imposed on the banks, to my mind, is simply not sensible and has no bearing with the reality. So, let me conclude then, and uh, uh, happy to take questions. Uh, debt is in many ways the most capitalist of contracts. Not so much because it is hard. Some, some people would say it's most capitalist because capitalism is a harsh system, and uh, that's what debt is. No, I would say it's most capitalist because it allows for anonymity. It allows for an expansion of the sphere of people who can do business together. That's why it's the most capitalist. It, it allowed, uh, in a sense, a much broader uh, area where people can engage. But there are downsides to debt. Uh, we've talked about that. They thunder bonds within the community. There's excess liquidation. There's debt overhang. And all these are very problematic for poor people who borrow which is why the hatred for money lenders across the world and certainly in India. But it's hard to do without it uh, for all the reasons I've said. And so the real answer here is moderation. Uh, some debt, but not too much. Uh, for example, today we've asked the microfinance firms when they lend to a, a poor borrower to register their loan. 
with the Credit Information Bureau. And once somebody has borrowed from more than two, two lenders, they should not borrow from more. A third lender who finds that this person has already borrowed from two should not make a loan to this person. It sounds paternalistic, but it is to avoid the overborrowing that we would otherwise get in the system, which would be really problematic. Uh, similarly, for large firms, today we've created a database at the central bank, which didn't exist before. At the RBI, today we have a database which we share with all the banks. Who has this person borrowed from? How much have they borrowed? What is the status of the loan? Is it performing, non-performing, soon to be non-performing, etc. Okay. So these kinds of information sharing, uh, as well as strengthening uh, uh, creditor rights, uh, helps mitigate the problem of excess debt uh, and overborrowing, which ultimately is problematic uh, for a for a country. And uh, finally, as far as India itself goes, one of the temptations during the period of easy money across the world, which is coming to an end, uh, if we believe all the commentary about the Federal Reserve uh, in the next, next week or so, that easy money was a temptation for us. We could have borrowed enormous amounts. Uh, you know, uh, countries in Africa suddenly increased the foreign share of government debt to 30, 40 percent. Today, in India, the government, sh uh, the foreign share of Indian government debt, which they really want to get into, is about 3.2%. 3 we kept it at this level simply because we don't want to be tempted by the easy money into overborrowing from the outside and getting into debt difficulties down the line. Similarly, we've said debt contracts that come into the country have to be minimum residual maturity of three years. Again, the hope is that when people have to invest for the longer term, when creditors want to invest for the longer term, they don't have the short horizons that would otherwise tempt them to overlend into the system and create difficulties for the system down the line. So in a number of ways, we are trying to address the principle that debt is good, too much debt is bad. And let's have, uh, as always, a golden mean. Let me stop there and uh, happy to take questions. Dr. Rajan for such an outstanding lecture. I think Presidency University is going to be in your debt for as long as we can remember. Thank you very, very much. Presidency University is also going to be indebted to Abhijit Vinayak Banerjee for persuading Dr. Rajan to come here today. Thank you, Abhijit. Thank you very much. Well, uh, this just to uh, interject at this point, uh, one debt I did not acknowledge to presidency is my mother studied here. <laughs> now you know. Now you know. There was a connection. <laughs> I would be amiss in my duties if I allowed the question answer session to start without correcting a mistake in my introduction. My introduction said that the economics department in its golden era did a lot and we had illustrious alumni and teachers. We may not be in our golden era today because it's all more competitive, very hard, and we struggle for lots of things. But I'm indeed blessed as a vice chancellor to have a wonderful, wonderful faculty of economics today. The young department, I call them young, it's one of our oldest departments, but the faculty, our median age is 35. They work hard, they soldier along, and I must compliment each and every member of our economics department faculty to do an outstanding job of persuading, of soldiering, of convincing me why they just 
must do better. My congratulations to Moshini Dutta and her team. A round of applause. This is the very, very young Moshini Dutta. I would also like to thank our students of the Department of Economics. They show their thirst for knowledge. They demand more. They activate for more. This makes us do more and more for them. May the spirit of the Department of Economics live forever beyond our 200th year, which is approaching in 2017. We are indeed very proud of all our economists, past, present, and future. Thank you all. And I would now like our third year UG student, Sharon Banerjee, to moderate the question answer session. Uh, so thank you for a very, very uh, illustrious speech on debt. And so before I go into uh, questions which are related to your lecture, we from the student, uh, we from the Department of Economics have a couple of questions for you. Um, so one of the questions would be, sir, in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, we've seen that many basic and mainstream principles of economics have come under direct attack. So, so what would your advice be to a hall full of students and aspiring economists who are studying these very basic principles in their classroom but are also exposed to all of these heavy criticisms of redundancy in the outside world. Sure. Hello. Can you hear me up there? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, the tendency at times like this is to throw everything out and say uh, the world is and you will see that what we throw out is, is often based on the political economy of the moment. So today, uh, it used to be the case that the received wisdom uh, before the financial crisis is don't distort prices uh, and have light regulation. Today, for example, in the financial sector, the answer seems to be Let's distort prices like mad, which central banks are doing across the world, and let's have very heavy regulation. Be wary about large swings in beliefs, because often they're wrong. Uh, there is something to be said for the old, but it missed out something. There's something to be said for the new, but it misses out something. The mean is somewhere in between. This is actually a point that Hirschman, I think, made a long time back, which is we tend to swing from one pole to another, rather than stay somewhere in the middle. The middle is rarely an attractive place to be, especially for radicals of either side, because the middle often requires, you know, trade-offs, judgments, is often much more nuanced. My definition of a populist is somebody who proposes simple solutions to everything and who doesn't recognize that the world is a really complex place. And I think we are today in the world of populism, whether populists of the left or populists of the right, who always have the simple, clear, and absolutely wrong solution to everything. <laughs> right? So let's avoid that. Recognize that perhaps we had under-regulated pre-financial crisis. There's some value to regulation. But recognize there's some value to getting prices right also, that distorting prices in a significant way eventually leads to a misallocation of resources and long-term harm. And let's uh, go to mean. Thank you, sir. Uh, there was another question which probably came in, uh, came in consensus from across the departments was, what led Raghuram Rajan, the engineer, to go into policy making and economics. You know, I, um, I actually, before I um, left school, I took what was then called the National Talent Exam. I don't know if uh, it still exists, NSTS. But I studied the social sciences for the National Talent Exam. 
Uh, and I came across the work of Keynes and, and thought, wow, what this is interesting stuff and so on. And I wanted to do that. But then the pressures of, uh, of middle class life sort of weighed on me. <laughs> and I took the science stream in school. And if you take the science stream, the next option is to, uh, uh, you know, sit for the IIT exams. And, and while I wanted to perhaps do a degree in economics from a good university in, uh, in, uh, in India, uh, once you get through the IIT exam after expending so much effort, uh, it seems like uh, you really should go and take it up because nobody else is crazy enough to leave the IITs and do something else. Uh, sorry to all the <laughs> economics students here, not a slur on you. So I got into the IIT, uh, IIT Delhi, uh, was doing electrical engineering and, and somewhere in my third year when I was dealing with fields and waves, uh, I said, is this really what I want to be doing in life? Uh, working with something which doesn't talk back, which has no, I, I don't have a feeling for. And that's when I decided that I should probably do something like economics and, and policy. <laughs> Uh, we'll open up the floor of the house to questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. There will be a lot of questions, so we'll probably start in order from the guests. <coughs> sir. Dr. Rajan. I'm Dr. Nirmala Mukherjee from Bengal Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for a wonderful speech, especially on tech. Because <coughs> we live in a state which is debt driven. And that's very important. So, my question is only <coughs> yesterday uh, you put up 150 truant companies for SDR. SDR, tax with debt, debt restructuring scheme. Now, when a state is really struggling to go ahead and debt comes in its way. It is happening here. Every year we are paying 28,000 crore and inherited financial mess. Everybody knows about it. Now the point is, is then debt politics or is it economics? Can your monetary issues really go into fiscal matters because this is a fiscal issue. And you are playing a very important role, very, very important role as a regulator. So if it is politics, it is a separate issue. What you discuss, it's some part is known, some part is unknown, but you discuss economics. So we we, are, from the Chamber of Commerce, we are very, very intrigued as to how to go about with it. Because we also do want that this state should go ahead. And there are industrial jobs because of this debt. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the question. First, uh, the, there are 150 firms uh, under the SDR. There are a uh, at this point, uh, a handful of firms. Uh, so, uh, but there are 150 firms plus who are in various forms of restructuring, and, and uh, perhaps that is the number that uh, that you have in mind. Uh, but the the real question uh, uh, you have is, uh, let let me take it outside the current context because I don't want to be commenting on on uh, on this situation uh, without. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the comments could be taken out of context. Is there a situation where a state, a country, uh, could be over-indebted uh, in such a way that it makes it difficult for economic activity to take place? And the answer to that question is yes. I mean, Greece was a situation where it was over-indebted. There was no hope that it could pay the amount of money that was required from Greece and therefore writing down the debt was probably wise in order to allow Greece to both survive as a country but also for the lenders to get the maximum possible 
uh, without killing the, the country, right? So even in the letters, for the letters sometimes it's in their interest to write down the debt. Now, where we are in West Bengal, whether we are in that kind of situation, I don't know. We need to do a proper debt, debt analysis to see what the appropriate level of debt is. From the concern of creditors in the international situation, why is debt forgiveness harder, is that they often worry about other countries. So in the Greece situation, a number of uh, lenders uh, within the European uh, Euro area wondered that if Greece got too good a deal, would the borrowers in Ireland, would the borrowers in, uh, in Spain and Portugal start saying, give us that same deal, even though they could service the debt. And moreover, could it encourage other countries to over-borrow knowing that they wouldn't have to repay? So again, it's a difficult trade-off. On the one hand, you want to revive the local economy. On the other hand, you also want to avoid moral hazard where somebody over-borrows knowing they don't have to repay. That trade-off has to be played well. I don't know what the situation is in West Bengal on these parameters exactly to give you an opinion. Thank you, sir. Um, questions from any of the guests first? Because we will go into descending order of importance from guests. Uh, just before you ask your question, since we're on, uh, we're running on a time constraint. If you could just keep it short and precise. Yeah, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Vedant from Area from St. Xavier. So my question is, sir, seeing the fact that the government was more, more, wants more money rolling in the economy, wouldn't be a, it wouldn't it be a good idea to cut down the FDRs that the bank provides, like it happens in the U.S., so that people in, instead of uh, depositing their money in the bank would instead invest in the share market. Uh, you want cut interest rates significantly so that people will invest in the share market. Yes, as it happens in the United States. <laughs> well, that, that's where I, I talked a little bit about distortions. Uh, do you really want to feed the share market in a way that it booms, uh, but booms perhaps more than it should? I don't know. Uh, one of the concerns about having rock bottom interest rates and seeing asset price inflation, which is what you're advocating, whether it be houses or whether it's, it's share markets, is asset prices that boom have to come down at some point. And the poor fellow who invests at the last minute may suffer the consequences of the bust. In general, I don't think it's a good idea to generate growth through what is called the wealth effect, getting people to feel wealthier so they go out and consume, because often that wealth effect is temporary rather than permanent. If you can generate a permanent wealth effect, that's good. But I think that comes from increased real activity rather than uh, increased prices of financial assets. That is why getting sustainable growth through a measured reduction in interest rates consistent with what inflation will allow is a much better way to engineer long-term growth rather than asset price booms, which will create much more havoc when they burst. Um, we are running currently short of time, so I've been told to invite Professor o Professor Obiji Banerjee onto stage sir? to share a few one words with us. Hello. Sir, can I ask you one question? Somebody wants to ask one question. Okay. Sir, one question. Last question. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Raja. Um, uh, we are very grateful for your last presence. So I would like to ask you one question. That there are a lot of discussion on ESG. On ESG, yes. So is it really going to be a game changer in Indian economy? And uh, uh, today in a Bengali daily, I read that uh, uh, by introducing a GST, there are likely maybe uh, some law on uh, federalism, on a state federalism. So is it really uh, good for Indian economy, or there are a lot of uh, things we are hearing? So is it really uh, going to happen uh, by uh, introducing the GST? So if you are asking my opinion on whether GST is, is by and large a good thing for the country, absolutely. Uh, and I think passage of, uh, of the GST uh, bill, of course there are uh, there's discussion about the details, but broadly the two big effects it will have are one, it could, in many countries where it's been implemented, increase uh, the, uh, uh, the tax take 
partly by bringing more people into the tax net, not so much by increasing the tax rate, but by, by bringing more people who are not paying taxes into the tax net. I, I think that's very good for India. Everybody should pay their tax burden and share the many needs that the country has for revenues. That's one. But uh, the second thing, which is as important, if not more important, is reduces barriers between states, unifies the country as a whole, and makes it one common market. And it's high time we were a one common market, uh, that we were a country where going across borders doesn't require significant transaction and tax costs. And that, I think, would be as big an advantage as the, uh, the improvement in in uh, revenue generation. Thank you, sir. Professor Banerjee? I'm just here to say thank you. Thank you, Raghu. Uh, my dad would have really appreciated that masterpiece of pedagogy. I think you brought out, I think the, the what's fun about economics, the fact that it's immediate, it's passionate, and yet it's complex and nuanced. Uh, you gave us a very, really, a very real sense of that. I think anybody who's here today will think about things in a way that be different as a result of your lecture. Thank you very much again. Thanks for coming. Thank you.